what I haven't done enough in the beginning is with your initial customers, really having crystal clear and eventually asking them one time too much on every step of why they eventually chose you and how that potentially changed even after signing a contract with you. Leaf Outbound is something that's tough but will always exist and should exist because I believe there's a lot of value in there if you, if you do it right. I'm always a, a big believer of Outbound and getting after your personas within your ICP companies. So I've always had a strong belief in that. That has been an evolving challenge to have that second line of revenue. In today's episode, my guest is Thomas de Klerk. Thomas is the founder of Lusmo, formerly known as Kumo. Lusmo helps businesses with implementing analytics in their platform via their AI-powered embed solution. Before starting Lusmo, Thomas worked in various roles and companies like project engineer, advanced business manager, and lastly, as a senior export consultant at Google. He always had a natural curiosity into the technical aspects of things, which has a really red line in his career. Live from Belgium, welcome to the show, Thomas. Thanks, Johan. Thanks for having me. <laughs> what an intro. Nice. Let's just dive right into Lasmo and in, into yourself. First of all, with Lasmo, when did you start it? The company officially launched end of 20, 2015. So it's a bit more than eight years now. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the transition of the, of the name, but it mm -hmm. was first called Kumul, right? Kumul IO, Kumul. Kumul. Yeah. That's also one of the reasons because it was sometimes or oftentimes a bit of discussion on how to pronounce, etc. So indeed, Kumul, Kumul IO mainly, yeah. Okay, nice. And are you funded or bootstrapped? No, we're a funded company. So we're funded over three funding rounds, 2017, 2020, 20, 2023, January, and total around... 14 million, mm -hmm. okay. Good. May I ask, what is your current ARR? We're beyond 5 million euros. Oh, and is there any separation for you guys between product and service? The ARR I mentioned is purely product. We do have additional services, more and more. A little part is recurring, but we don't, do also have, when it comes to onboarding, potential also validation of the software in the sales process, some additional revenue, but it's not included in the recurring because it's... Yeah. How many employees do you guys have right now? Just beyond 50. How would you explain what does Lasmo do? Yeah, you explain it. So we mainly work together with software and, and SaaS companies, and we offer them a building block. You might have Stripe or Paddle for payments, or intercom for chat, ready to empower when it comes all things, dashboards, reports, analytics for their end users. So really offering an off-the-shelf product so they can just plug it in, let the management to customer success and products, offloading developers to develop and maintain dashboards and reports inside the application. Yeah. We're going to dive into the personal aspect. May I ask how old are you? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you look young. 38? Yeah, I'm 39. Yeah. Oh, that's a pretty good guess. Good guess, yeah. And is this your first startup? It's a first startup. Yeah. First time founder together with Kai and Ahun, so we're three first time founders. But we've been on the road for eight years. It's been a run. It's been a while. But I've been working before, like you mentioned in the intro. So let's say half working on Cumulayo Losmo and half divided over three, let's say, employee roles I've had. Yeah. Have you always wanted to be an entrepreneur? It's a good question. I believe so. I still have some memories that I have had written down. So it's somewhere deep in, inside of me. Indeed, that's something that has been itching, so to say. And then back in 2015 or early 2016, because Kyle Ahun already had a technical MVP around that time. Kyle is a youth friend of mine. We bumped into each other when I was still at Google. And he showed me and he was like, we want to bring this to the markets and I'm looking for a third founder to cover that part. And that's how the ball started rolling. I see you were able to join them. Yes, yeah, exactly. And do you guys have an end goal to find with Lasmo? We're funded or a venture backed company. So last round, last funding round was early last year. So a bit more than a year ago. So right now the, the next stage is to go beyond obviously that 5 million. We were at a lower error at the funding round. But the, the next milestone is towards the 10 million that we have in mind. So the, the current milestone that we're working on with that's all 50 lesbians. And when you look at the growth, is that something which keeps you motivated? Or I guess to rephrase it, what keeps you motivated to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. keep going every day? Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously for myself and, and the, the founding team, it's been a long ride. And what's currently keeping motivated, it's also an 
continuous learning about yourself. Where do you get your energy from? An example I can give is that we hired a VP sales, an external VP sales in April this year, so about four months ago. That was the decision I said maybe after seven years, so about September last year. It's time for a fresh wind, let's put it that way, because the energy that I keep on getting is also from more from the, the new ideas and new experiments. So currently I'm rather having a role obviously with the AI wave that we're, we're on, exploring with existing customers, also net new prospects, where Lusmo with a new AI component can make a difference. So when it comes to your question, that's what I'm currently doing together with CTO founder, Ru and his team, really looking into a, a second product and how to commercialize that. Yeah, so you can, where you lost the energy, you will bring somebody else on and you yeah. can focus on what you really love doing. Exactly. Currently at the stage, uh, 50 let's say 50 plus people in the commercial team, it's around 15, 16 people. I think the operational components from that role is something that I found less appealing. And I also believe other people may be better than myself. So that's an evolution which I found natural and then also came step by growing into the team where I learned about myself where I should be focusing on. Yeah. Nice. This was quite a bit of the fire round. We're going to dive now deeper into, into sure. your journey. I'm um, going to start at the beginning, three founders, you came into the founding team you mentioned. Yeah. How did you guys came up with the idea of Lasmo? Yeah, it's an idea of uh, Karen Haroun, um, a CEO, CTO, that actually were back in the days, even before 2015, colleagues at a business intelligence BI consulting firm, where they were working with existing technologies, typically more legacy, very technical players and customizing or implementing that technology at larger corporates. So a very technical implementation, but still implementing that over time with a nice price ticket for non-technical users, whether we're thinking with also SaaS coming up, why don't we build a product where they can, from day one, non-technical people actually start working with their data and visualizing in a very easy way those reports. That was the initial ID they came up with and they started working on as an MVP in their spare time. And yeah, fast forward to today, but actually fast forward after a year or two also with me on board is we initially had a different product or a different end use case. We were prior to Google Data Studio, Power BI, et cetera, we were an internal reporting application. So where you could connect your CRM, other applications for, let's say, SMB players all around. And eventually after a year and a half in, we actually switched the use case to yeah, to SaaS players to be an embedded component, to be part of other software offerings rather than a standalone reporting solution. So we actually pivoted in the, the first year and a half, Johan. Yeah, because that kind of goes into my next question I was going to ask. Did you know from the beginning it was such a success, but you pivoted after a year and a half? So most likely not, but you knew you guys had something and... I uh, yeah. went from there. What was the feedback from the market? Like, how did you guys knew that it, it was going to be a success with the pivot, for example? Yeah. Looking back is we actually grew to a, a nice level of ARR on the internal reporting solution. And we also got our first, let's say, pre-seed funding round with the majority of the ARR coming from the internal reporting solution. But actually, initial customers were software companies and they like the experience, they like the, the UI and the look and feel and the options to fully customize and white label the end results. So the initial questions came from our, our first customers. So we quite soon also, as we were API first, had that secondary offering. And then just to be fully transparent, other players come up with eventually also free solutions. So a certain moment in time, we said, okay, we need to go all in on that second offering while maintaining the existing customer base, but not welcoming new customers in that uh, initial offering. Just through the market evolution, we had initial traction on the first one, but quite naturally the second offering, the embedded offering came along and we really had to go on that one. And it's, it's always funny. You see these memes that I guess like bootstrapping, or at least what I see a lot that a lot of bootstrappers, like they say, we listen a lot to our customers and we talk to them all the time where funded companies just do marketing and try to get as much as possible. But it's really nice to hear that you guys listened a lot and the pivot actually came from talking to your customers yeah. a lot. Yeah, that's true. Interesting memes, actually. Then There's <laughs> definitely some truth in there. And I know that a lot of companies are struggling with the early stages. Mm -hmm. Can you tell a little bit about your journey on getting your first paid clients in? A couple of things there. Yeah, we're from Belgium, small country. 
even smaller than Netherlands. <laughs> also a pretty complex country in a way that we have three national languages. So in general, we quite soon look beyond the Belgian boundaries in a second phase. But the first phase when it comes to first customers is very much when it comes to network. Our first customer was, for example, a former employer of Kyle and Arun. Then what we did in the early days, I think we've done maybe all type of incubators and, and programs we have in Belgium, even eventually six, seven of them. That's also, especially as we were present in the software market, we were selling to other participants and eventually other software players part of those programs. That's an important one. And to my prior points, as we're a small country, I pretty soon, for example, when it comes to the US, uh, today we have one third of our revenue coming from the US. We actually started flying as of 2017 regularly to the US to look for first customers there and eventually grow also a team over there. Yeah, that's interesting. So you joined as many incubators as you can, uh, and then you had clients who basically fit the ICP most likely, so you're mm -hmm. able to sell to them. And yep. did they take any equity or was it purely like you just had to pay to get? From all the programs we did, only one took some equity, of course, with some I don't know, initial tickets linked to that as well. Always a fun question, which I'm going to ask now, like everybody, can you tell about a moment you like your rock bottom moment and how did you get out of that there are definitely a couple of, of those moments specifically at cumula Luzmo. i wouldn't say the like i mentioned in the previous topic the us part was a walk in the park at all i still remember the end of 2017 was the first time and then we flew a couple of times a year especially the first times in the us wasn't easy i still remember the first customer we signed up there was after weeks if not months of hard work at the beginning indeed you were going there we had very limited funding you start counting up costs, right? Flights, staying there, and you think, is this all worth it? But eventually you roll into that first couple of prospects, that first deal where you were even up to the bigger competitors. And if you then win that and then take a bet on a first full-time salesperson on the ground, that's something that in hindsight, I believe was one of the key turning points that we had so far in our growth story. Yeah. And would you recommend, because there's a lot of people who want to sell to you as companies, of course. would you recommend doing something similar to what you guys did, keep traveling there? Or? Yes, I would recommend keeping on traveling there as much as you can. If I were to do something different, and I know that's not always easy for people tuning in or eventually also for myself or the other fam families' context, if I would do it again, I would still do it the same way, but eventually also consider moving there. That's a classic one, I know that I believe it could make even a bigger difference. You're still on your journey, right? Would yeah. you even consider moving there right now or is it a no-go for you? I would indeed consider it. But of course, let's say personally wise, it should all in all pieces of the puzzle should fall together. I'm still convinced now or in the early days, at 2017, 2018, I still believe it would make a difference. Yeah. And I'm and even we'll more convinced about it if you look at how the, the last couple of years have been. We've had a very nice ride also in the US. One third of our revenue is coming from there. But I believe you even have a bigger uh, impact. I'm actually convinced yeah. about it. And when we go back to like the, the rock bottom moment, was this also the biggest uh, challenging period for yourself as a founder? Definitely one of them, yeah. You're just so dedicated to make it work. And I'm always thinking about that first deal, but eventually... It's also the transition towards setting up of welcoming a first sales representative and thinking back, he joined Q4 2019. So onboarding in Belgium, we hired a Belgium colleague to join and then flying over early 2020, COVID hitting in. So it was okay. Let's say the most of the work that we have been doing was getting out there in New York, meeting of people that wasn't possible. So luckily we were able to help him succeed, let's say the US part of a business through during COVID proof that we could also sell just purely of a video call. So that was an important moment as well. Yeah. And these are already like company challenges because the next question I wanted to ask, what has been the biggest company challenge you guys had? Mm -hmm. Are there any other, there are many challenges you, you probably yeah, faced yeah, along the definitely. way. Mm -hmm. There are many Challenges, I believe what could be interesting here is if we would focus on the go-to-market parts. There we've been lucky and we've done a great job with our initial marketing colleague who is still with us, by the way, Mika. Shout out to her to really build a very decent inflow of inbound leads and inbound AIR. When it comes to the challenge that I want to highlight is I'm always a big believer of outbound and getting after your 
personas within your ICP companies. So I've always had a strong belief in that. That has been an evolving challenge to have that second line of revenue. Perhaps you can talk to that as well. For sure, so we've seen great success. In the early days, we had decent success. Then we hired some experienced reps in the team who helped us shape uh, a next move of outbound revenue. Eventually also right now, the market in terms of tools and strategies has really much evolved. You might come to that later. If I would do it again, especially nowadays, I would do it differently. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to ask that later. And you mentioned already, you go to market strategy, you mentioned inbound. Because what is, if we're going to talk about the positive things, like what has been the best thing so far you've done to grow Lusmo uh, to where it is today? That's still, and if I look at the whole journey, is that... And obviously, I speak to a lot of SaaS companies that we've been lucky, but I believe as a company, we've done also a great job on making sure that true content accompanied with some paid initiatives, we've been able to reach, let's say, our SaaS and software companies we're going after. And we've been able to let them download white papers, start trials. We have also very transparent pricing and really getting in touch with them and from there actually accompanying them across the line and become eventually a customer with us. I believe that's been one of our main growth levers, let's say in the initial days, even a year or two back. And now we're juggling also that part with outbound and really finding a, a nice balance. But it's a continuous exercise to keep inbound up and complement with. Yeah, because you mentioned like inbound content, uh, running a lot of content, but have the paid assist, as you said. Yes. Like also went through that. Because is that, and now you're doing outbound, is there anything else you've done in your go-to-market strategy where mm -hmm. other SaaS funders can learn from? Yeah, and that might tap into an editors as well. It's been two years that I've been dedicating, let's say, part of my time also towards all things partnerships. So not only build or service partnerships, but eventually also product partnerships. That's a tough one. Even now, if we're beyond the, the, the 5 million, I had some successes, but that's uh, one of them took quite some time. And right now it's back to the reactive part. So it's not a proactive go-to-market component that we're pushing today. But indeed there, I've seen success now with a service provider who's using our product and also looking towards incorporating it in their product offering and their service offering. So we have a product that they can implement with their customers. Yes, we're working with that, but it takes a lot of time, especially if you're, I can only speak for myself, a first time founder and you haven't done it before. But that's, it's something that I've been playing with, let's say, for a year. And eventually one of those efforts came back two years later and eventually became a customer. But yes, so it's, it's the third lever that we've been pulling eventually with success, but it does take a lot of time. Yeah, but it's now somewhat, as you mentioned, on the bench, like you're not actively doing anything right now with it. No. Besides the one you got in. Are you struggling to find people and companies which have access to your ideal customer profile? At Redditors, we just launched a second side of the marketplace, which allows you to search, filter, and contact B2B SaaS affiliates, which have access to the audience you're looking for. We do this by leveraging first-party data sources. Want to learn more? Go to getreditors.com. And when we talk about your go-to-market strategy, did you guys make any critical decisions? If you now look back, like if I haven't done X, Y, Z, we wouldn't be here. So again, it's the inbound motion, although we wouldn't have come to initial funding routes or initial successes for sure. I believe outbound is something that's tough, but will always exist and should exist because I believe there's a lot of value in there if you, if you do it right. And also in my current role, like I mentioned, so I'm iterating, for example, on new product line, incorporating AI, but also use that extra time I have to experiment with other go-to-market techniques. So I'm a bit more looking forward now, if that's okay to answer your question. So I've always been a big believer in events and partly linked, for example, to the partnerships that I, if you look to tech partnerships, so let's say, for example, databases that you would connect to Lusmo. I'm currently looking into partnering up with some of these providers and do joint meetups or small events and see if we can um, invite joint prospects, joint customers, but also just refer them to each other. It's not a very new technique, but it's something that we haven't been doing uh, too often, and which I believe we should do just more, not even always having 50 or 100 people. Could be also breakfast sessions, for example. It's something that I believe we should do more with also more players than the few ones that we're currently leveraging. Yeah, I think it's always a great way to get yourself showcased towards their users and, yeah. and vice versa. But 
think the most important thing is you're going to drive it with value. You mentioned breakfast sessions, which often means is you're going to share value and hopefully not selling yeah. too much regarding no. the, the session. No, that's a need. Making sure that it's not too branded, too sales driven, making sure that in the cases that we're doing that, there's a case with somebody who comes and share how been, they've been doing before, how they're currently doing so in many cases, also leveraging technology of the partner. And then we also have a case for our customers accompanying that with pizza and some drinks afterwards. So there's no pull, no push on, on sales. And we've done a few of these. We should do more of these, to be honest. Yeah. But as you mentioned, they do take a lot of time and uh, it's a long effort as well. You don't yeah. get instant results. Maybe a bit of a side question. Like you guys changed the name. You already mentioned a little bit at the beginning. What's the reason behind the, the, the name yeah. slash brand change? I think one of the main reasons was is that in Dutch, we, it's called Cumulio. Then if you translate to English, it's Cumulio. Then you mentioned in the beginning Cumul. Some people have a lot of other vowel alterations like Kamal or Kimil. I don't know where <laughs> that actually came from, but we decided after the last funding round, let's not only link to the name, but eventually also the branding, but also the positioning. I mentioned about you that pivot that we did in the early days, but Let's also think about the messaging, the visuals, but also the wording. And there we went for a wider rebranding exercise that also changed the names. But if you would compare our, our website and our messaging, that has also changed about a year. Yeah, and, and I noticed that the LinkedIn company page is still has formerly Como. Yeah, we still have it in there. And I also noticed when I reach out or I restart a conversation with somebody that I hadn't had for a couple of months, that I still put it in there formerly Cumulio, or that I also mentioned that we changed names and I still drop Cumulio in there. At some point, that will fade out, but indeed we still keep it, for example, on the LinkedIn page for now as well. It's also a good way to, to find out who is doing some outbound or reaching out to us, leveraging our LinkedIn name, for example, because if you see in the title of an email or in the body of an email, you're pretty sure that they are automating their messaging. That's yeah, a side remark. Yeah. It's, it's a good one because we had the same thing with our LinkedIn profile. It wasn't just called Redditors, but we had something behind it. And then you can clearly see if people just use it as a custom attribute in exactly. their email campaigns. Yeah. When we look at your journey, is there yeah. something you regret the most you didn't do or maybe did too late? In hindsight, obviously, it's always easy looking back. It was a, a time when it comes to go to market. I'm mainly focusing here on go to market. That's fine. We actually grew the SDR team to at some point seven or nearly eight SDRs with initially indeed great results. But in hindsight, I wouldn't have uh, scaled that up so fast. Of course, now where you see a lot of initiatives with a different role for SDRs or where you see that it's not always that capital efficient anymore. But even back then, I wouldn't have done it at that speed. Yeah. So and like you mentioned sure. earlier, we had some funding back then. I think back then, our light strong was 10 million, so you could count back. Back then, it was much leaner in terms of funding. Even back then, I wouldn't have done it at that speed. Is it then that the numbers didn't really work out because you were going too fast with them? Or? Eventually, let's say after, in the beginning, it did work out, especially with the, with the initial SDR team. It looked promising just by having more SDRs doing the same, of executing the same strategy. If you just would extrapolate, it would have made sense. Initially it did, but then still, I believe we should have rather spread over time with a smaller team. I, I believe that would have been a, a better approach. Yeah. We look at new technologies. You guys have an AI powered embed solution. So you're definitely leveraging new technologies like yeah. AI. Tell me a bit more, like how are you guys using AI machine learning in day to day and maybe in the product? Product wise, two things I can tell you in the current product, what we already have is the possibility to build dashboards to in a second step, then obviously embed them in your application. So fully white labeled. So the building of those dashboards that we have that AI powered, meaning that you could instruct with a prompt what to build a chart, many, a couple of charts, even suggest charts to be built through AI. So that's facilitating the dashboard creation part. That's one. And then the second one, which is uh, part of my new role is that we believe there is quite some value to use AI beyond the visual layer to rather ask questions. Imagine I'm a CRM user that instead of asking AI to build a dashboard is really asking AI to answer a question on my build on my business. Let's say, how is my business doing? Or if I'm a, for example, logistical player, are my 
deliveries being delivered in time and you get a texture or, or an answer on my business accompanied with visual insights but you, you can directly use ai on the underlying data rather than using ai to build dashboards on your data and that's something that we have a big belief in that we have seen a lot of confirmation from our customers and prospects so we're currently for focusing quite some of our development efforts on that. Yeah, so like the underlying thing you say is you save people time with AI, like either building the, the charts or you're giving them insights like by talking to their data one-on-one. -on -one. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and I really love like these kind of things where it's really value-driven, so you really build it to make yeah. your client either saving time or giving them more insights. Exactly. When we look back at your journey and you might've covered it already a little bit, but what has been like your we always love this, like fuck up or failure. What has been like your biggest moment where you're like, oh shit. Obviously a couple of my already touched upon is like going too fast while we should have been a bit more careful on spending our money on, on building a team that, that eventually was too overstaffed to what we're doing on the outbound side. That's what I uh, mentioned earlier. There obviously also fuck ups of deals that we should have <laughs> approached differently, but also a couple of deals, maybe as something I can share is that Something that I believe there's still, even recently, like deals that just answer of people, conversations, companies, hey, we just went with another vendor. I recently turned around one of these answers is that don't take any reply just for granted. Try to understand, and like you mentioned, bootstrap company or not, really understand why they would even choose another vendor. Sometimes they just believe you can't do X, Y, Z, but if you then potentially have done a better job in the beginning, but still hopefully grasp that last chance to explain why X, Y, Z would be different with us. There we definitely would have, with that, which is where we have done not a great job, but also some recent examples where you always need to challenge uh, an eventual outcome, of course, in a polite way, but that can still deliver results. It's still two months ago where we won very important customers where the initial reply was things but we won't go for another vendor yeah that's a good insight if you could do it again from the start what would you do differently what i still had a conversation earlier today with with one of our colleagues here is is us being a funded company and you mentioned in the beginning but i like the wording actually still aim to wear as much as possible your bootstrapped hat where you should keep your customer at heart and don't think too much out of your internal lingo or your internal metrics and really be rather their help, their support, their specialists to achieve their goal and their strategy rather than thinking, hey, let's have a demo. Let's show what we have without really showing what is of interest and importance to them. And that's something in the sales process, but also in the post-sales customer success is something that I believe we or generally everybody should still be aware of and really keep on focusing on. Nice. We're going to dive into the last bit yeah. of the podcast recording. We're going to dive into hopefully practical advice based on revenue stages. So what yeah. kind of advice would you give now another SaaS founder who's just starting out and growing to 10K monthly recurring revenue? What I would do, and I believe that I have done, I'm just speaking for myself, but I haven't done enough in the beginning is with your initial customers, really having crystal clear and eventually asking them one time too much on every step of why they eventually chose you and how that potentially changed even after signing a contract with you. I don't think, at least we haven't done that enough, and I'm not sure if you're at 10K MRR or, or lower, you're grasping and putting enough time in that because that can be so crucial for yourself going to a next AR or MRR milestone. Because from your existing customers, it's classic, but again, I believe we haven't done that enough. Is really understanding for your existing customers how they came along and how that opinion still is today, because that's exactly what should go into your marketing and your sales pitch for finding new customers. It's I no rocket it's... science, but I believe that we haven't done that, done that enough. We're doing better now, but it's something I would really recommend NKMR customers especially if you're non-funded, but even if you're funded, you should still do that. It's an easy More. thing to forget because as soon yeah, as yeah. I guess the contract comes in or the credit card is added, then you support them, but it's an important question to ask. I, I and maybe agree. one more, it's an, I would say a relatively recent insight for myself. It's also going beyond it saves time. It 
brings extra revenue. It increases your ROI, which it's true, but you should even get that more concrete and find a way because those levers could be on the website of every one of your competitors is finding words and explanations of your customers that are that specific about your solution that other ones wouldn't have or would have a very hard time to find out. Yeah, because it's easy to start using that in your messaging. You're going to do cold outreach, paid ads, That's true. That's website, true. etc. So let's assume we pass 10K MOR. You're on your journey now as well towards 10 million ARR. I guess yeah. what kind of advice would you give yourself and other SaaS founders who pass 10K MOR and growing to 10 million ARR? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously your MRR level and if at all you choose for funding should permit it. But I would recommend for a lot of founders on the podcast is to think about where do you get the most of your energy from? And where do you believe you help your company the most? For myself, that's also the, the recent transition where we hired a VP sales, taking on the, the sales team, of course, and when it comes to the strategy, but especially the operational part, and then myself focusing on new initiatives. I believe if you can, and you believe that also counts for yourself, for the energy and the value you can bring, I would rather recommend that doing that earlier than later. And it's beyond the title you hold I believe you shouldn't keep your VP, C-level, director title just for the title. Look beyond that and, and see where you can bring your company to the next level in the, the best role that gives you the most energy. Yeah, because that's the most important thing. Like you're already mm -hmm. going at it for eight years, so you need to keep yourself motivated. That's like true. What you mentioned, you have to keep doing things you find fun. Cool. Let 100%. me try to... Summarize, you don't have to come up with an idea as a founder. You could actually join a team of other founders if they already have an idea. Join as many incubators as you can, especially if the other ones fit your ICP. It could be a really good selling point. Mm -hmm. Pivoting becomes a lot easier if you talk and listen to your customers. Keep asking them why they chose you. Find specific value points. If you're selling in the US or want to sell in the US, go there as much as you can. Even consider moving. Outbound is becoming a lot more challenging in 2024. If your energy goes down on a certain aspect, hire somebody else to take over your role. And especially if you're on your way to 10 million ARR when you can take more employees on board. Partnerships take a long time. Joint events are a great way to start with. Don't scale up your sales too fast. Make sure the financial actually work out and then leverage AI to drive more value, save people time or give them more insights. Well done. There we go. People can just listen to the summary. Yeah. Nice. It was really nice uh, having you on the show, Thomas. If people want to reach out to you, what would be the best way to do? The best way for getting in touch with me is, is I would say, LinkedIn. Thomas de Klerk, or I guess LinkedIn slash de Klerk Thomas. That's the easiest way to get in touch. We're going to make sure that we link back towards your LinkedIn profile. We're going to add a link to Losmo, AI-powered embed solution for SaaS companies. Definitely, if you're struggling with your analytics, check them out. And if you're listening, please leave us a review on the platform you're listening right now so we can help other SaaS founders out there. And we're going to add a poll to this podcast as well to get your opinion on it. Thanks again for coming on, Thomas. With a lot of pleasure. Thanks, Johan. Cheers. Thank you for watching this show of the Grow Your B2B SaaS podcast. You made it till the end, so I think we can assume you like this content. If you did, uh, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. If you like this content, Feel free to reach out if you want to sponsor the show, if you have a specific guest in mind, if you have a specific topic you want us to cover, reach out to me on LinkedIn. More than happy to take a look at it. If you want to know more about Reddit, feel free to reach out as well. But for now, have a great day and good luck growing your B2B SaaS.